This is the Amazon Kindle, and it's one of the devices that launched e-ink into the limelight back in the mid-2000s. E-ink existed before then, it just wasn't really until e-readers from companies like Sony and Amazon came out that they gained public attention. I talk a lot about e-ink on this channel, but today we're going to have a deep dive into the technology behind these displays. E-Ink was created at MIT in the late 90s with the intention of creating an electronic book that could be stared at for extended periods of time without straining the eyes. It had to be easy to read in the sunlight and be powered by a battery for extended periods of time, like the length of a holiday. The creators were basically trying to make a new form of display that would mimic the appearance of ink on paper. The way E-Ink works is actually very simple. If you can understand how magnets work, then you can understand how e-ink works. However, instead of dealing with magnetic fields, we're dealing with electric fields. The two are obviously different, but the principle is the same. Opposite charges will attract and like charges will repel. E-ink uses this principle along with a viscous liquid to move charged colored particles within a container, which when the charge is removed, will leave those particles floating in suspension. For a super crude example of this, if I take this pot of rice syrup and throw in some ball bearings, I can get them to move up and down using a magnet. When I take the magnet away, the ball bearings stay floating where they are. Of course, the ball bearings have no charge, the magnet isn't an electric field, and to make this work I had to leave it in the fridge to make the rice syrup viscous enough, which incidentally is one of the limitations of e-ink. So let's take a capsule filled with clear viscous liquid, throw in a bunch of positively charged white particles and negatively charged black particles. When we apply an electric field across it, our particles will be attracted and repelled accordingly. And then when we remove the electric field, they'll stay where they are, more or less indefinitely. Those charged particles will then either reflect light or absorb it exactly like ink does. And in doing so, we've made our electronic paper. Whilst this principle is the same regardless of the display, e-ink has released multiple variants of the technology since the original. Carter introduced higher DPI displays by using smaller particles, which allowed for smaller electrodes and thus higher pixel densities. Spectra introduced three color displays, black, white, and red, and black, white, and yellow, and more recently, black, white, red, and yellow. An advanced color e-paper, which introduced multicolored displays by using cyan, magenta, yellow, and white particles. E-Ink claimed that this technology allows up to 50,000 colors to be produced. But there's more behind the technology than what I've shown so far. There are limitations to what e-ink displays are capable of, such as the effect temperature has, their ability to show colors, and their time to update. I mentioned that I left this pot of rice syrup in the fridge to increase the viscosity, and temperature affects e-ink in the same way. They generally work from around minus 10 or 0 degrees C up to 50 or 60 degrees C, depending on the display. But the time to update is much slower at the colder end of the spectrum, and if the display exceeds its temperature limits, it can cause lasting damage. I've shown that capsules can be filled with more than two particles to show more colors, but electric fields only deal with two charges, positive and negative. So how do we deal with a display that has more? We add in more colored particles, but by changing the size and varying how much charge each particle holds, we can alter how fast they move through the viscous liquid. Once we have particles that move at different speeds and accelerate at different rates, we can shuffle them into any layout that we like, or even blend particles together to create different colors. The closer a particle is to the surface of the capsule, the greater the intensity of that color, and this same principle is used on black and white displays to create different shades of gray. Some advanced color e-paper displays can blend particles like this, but others, such as the display in my inky impression video, can only show seven colors as they are driven by cheaper, more simple controllers. Arranging particles takes time, and whilst grayscale displays can achieve the desired effect quite quickly, once you start shuffling around more than two particles, the update times get significantly longer. And for this reason, I can't see multicolored displays ever having a fast update, because the physics just doesn't allow it. That's why you'll only see these displays being used for signage and shelf label applications where days might pass between updates and then really update time isn't too important. Alongside these multicolored displays is the Kaleido technology, 
which uses a black and white e-ink display capable of showing grayscale with an overlaid color filter array like a traditional LCD. Kaleido displays have significantly quicker update times than advanced color e-paper, since we're dealing with two charged black and white displays, but the pixel density is lower since each pixel requires multiple color channels and the displays aren't as vibrant since the color filter array blocks some of the light that the e-ink display reflects. A Kaleido display is what you'll find on e-readers such as the Pocketbook Color, as the update time is obviously more appropriate for reading books or comics. Quite recently, e-ink released an update to their Kaleido technology that has improved performance by creating a finer color filter array and getting it closer to the display underneath. They've said that that helped increase pixel density and also adding a built-in front light has helped improve brightness and vibrancy. We've looked at why colored displays update slower than black and white displays, but just how quickly can black and white displays update? I've shown fast updating displays in a previous video, but I didn't really explain the concept behind it. A display performing a full update will involve a bit of flashing between black and white states, and this is to ensure that the display updates nice and clearly. The charged particles can obviously attract one another, and updates aren't usually as simple as just applying an electric field for a set amount of time. Some displays may take a few seconds to achieve this, but there are displays capable of performing full updates in less than a second. As well as this, some e-ink displays can update instantly without this flashing, and this is called a partial update. It sacrifices update quality in favor of a fast, instant update. You can see here the ghosting left behind of the previous image due to a partial update. Not all display panels have this capability, so if you're looking for an e-paper display for your project, check to see if the product description mentions support for partial updates or partial refreshes. The other thing to note when buying e-paper displays is whether or not the controller is on the display itself, called an all-in-one display or AIO display, or if it's externally controlled. An AIO display is quite easy to get up and running, requiring a minimal number of external components and requiring only a serial interface with a few control lines. Commands are then sent as you would any other modular display to control configuration, upload the buffer, and to initiate an update. Generally, these displays aren't capable of showing shades of gray. They can't always perform partial updates and they tend to be limited in size. Externally controlled displays require an external controller and there aren't that many out there. The most popular ones you'll see on pretty much all the Raspberry Pi hats, breakout boards, and other products aimed at makers is the IT8951 from ITE. The circuitry required is quite complex as all the different voltages for the display need to be generated and calibrated to the panel. And the controller also requires an update waveform to be programmed, which dictates which voltages are sent to each electrode on the display and when. I won't get into too much detail about this because those products generally come working out the box and you don't really need to worry about it. The upside to using an external controller is that you get the full capability of e-ink, such as super fast updates, providing you're not using color, the capability for grayscale, partial updates, windowed updates, where only a select area of the display is updated, and no real restriction on size. The largest e-ink panel I've seen is 42 inches and requires four controllers to run, but it still updates just as fast as a six inch display. I hope you learned a lot about the way e-ink works. If you have any questions about the technology or what products are available for makers, then leave a comment down below and check out some of my other videos on e-ink if you're interested. If you enjoyed the video, leave a like, subscribe for more content like this, and I'll see you guys in the next one.